Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in the previous video, we did some very simple optimization for multivariate functions. Now, a lot of the simplicity of that came down to the fact that we we're optimizing over a very simple domain. If you remember, we were optimizing over the first quadrant in the Euclidean plane. So that was where s and t were greater than or equal to zero. Now, as I mentioned to you, things get much more complicated when you start to optimize over more complex domains. And the topic of this lecture today is going to be on what are called Lagrange multipliers. These are ways that we can solve for these maxima over more complex geometries. Now, the goal of this lecture is to introduce the basic concepts and walk through some simple examples. In the next video, then we'll apply it back to a similar uh, produ production of televisions uh, example. Okay, so here's the basic idea. Imagine I've got a function, I'll call it y, and it is a function of many variables. Okay, so x1, x2, x3, all the way up to xn. And the goal for me is to optimize this, but I want to optimize it subject to, so subject to, Okay, I want to optimize it subject to these constraints. And the constraints can get, be given by functions. Let's put dot, dot, dot. Okay, so in my case, I'm going to have maybe multiple constraints. There can be potentially as many as you'd like or as many as necessary. I'm going to say that there are k of them. So there's n variables. And there are k constraints. Now, you can alternatively think of this thing, all right? So I gave you constraints here. You can alternatively think of this thing as optimizing, optimize f over a set s given by all of the points in Rn, x1 up to xn, such that g i of x1 through x n is equal to a constant uh, i for every single i from 1 to k. Okay, so this is uh, a way that we can encode complex geometries, right? So, for example, if I wanted to optimize f over a circle in the plane, my g function, I would only have one of them, it would be x squared plus y squared, or x1 squared plus x2 squared, is equal to whatever the radius squared of that circle is. So again, I'm going to walk you through examples. But the question is, how do you do this? Well, an extreme point, so a critical point, so an extreme point x and s, well, this thing satisfies or solves. The gradient of f, we knew that that was going to be involved, equal to uh, lambda 1 times the gradient of g plus lambda 2, sorry, g1, times the gradient of g2 plus all the way up to lambda k times the gradient of gk. Now, this has to work for some lambda 1 all the way up to lambda k. Okay, so what is going on here, right? This is a fairly complex looking equation, right? So first, I want you to notice a few things about this. You're not just setting the gradient equal to zero because you have these constraints, right? You're optimizing over a set where uh, you, you are constraining the variables. Okay, so that's where the g's come in. But that means that I need to solve for n variables, xn, right? x1 all the way up to xn. But I also need to solve for k more variables, lambda 1, lambda 2, all the way up to lambda k. OK, these lambdas, we call them Lagrange multipliers, OK? And that means that we need to solve for n plus k variables, right? So there are n plus k variables to solve, right? That's x1 all the way up to xn, 
lambda 1 all the way up to lambda k. So there's a lot of variables here that need to be considered. But the way you can knock this down is, again, reminding yourself that you need to restrict to these, uh, to these constraints. Now I'm going to walk you through some examples in a moment, but the first thing that you should ask yourself is why, right? Where does this come from? All right, so here's what I want to do. I want to motivate this with just one constraint, okay? So motivation. Okay, if I only have one constraint, then k is equal to 1. And so then these Lagrange multiplier equations ask me just to solve for the x's and only one lambda so that this equation is true. Okay, so the geometrical interpretation here is that g of x1 all the way up to xn is equal to a constant. This thing is an n minus 1 dimensional surface in Rn, right? So again, think about my circle example, right? The circle is in two variables, x1 and x2 space. And it might be given by x1 squared plus x2 squared is equal to 1, OK? So that's my circle, my unit circle in R2. Now, the circle is a one-dimensional object. It is a one-dimensional object in two-dimensional space. Now, this extends fairly generally, right? So if I give you a function equal to a constant, this is a level set of a, of a function, it's typically going to be an n minus one-dimensional surface in Rn. Also, what else do we know about this? We know that the gradient is perpendicular to the surface. At every single point, the gradient is perpendicular to the surface. So maybe we've got you know, a surface that looks something like this. That's my g equal to c surface, maybe. It's just sort of localized. And that tells us that at any point, the gradient vector is perpendicular to this thing. OK, so now think about what the optimization problem is telling us to do. It says, find the maximal value so that you are constrained to this surface, right? So you have a bigger space that you have the potential uh, to work in, but you're stuck on the surface. You can never get off of it. Well, what the Lagrange multiplier equation is reminding you of is that this gradient on this side the gradient of f always points in the direction that you are increasing the most, right? Your steepest ascent. So gradient of f equals direction of steepest ascent. Ascent in, uh, in f. Right? So if you want to get bigger values of f, just walk in the direction of the gradient always. Right? Follow that gradient, and it's going to lead you to the top. OK, so what does this mean? Well, when you are at an extreme point in this uh, function f, this thing will be equal to 0. OK, that's fine. Right? We already did that. But what happens if you are stuck on the surface, right? You can only sort of walk around on this surface. Well, what's going to happen is this thing, if you are at the biggest possible value that you could get to, this gradient is going to tell you eventually that you need to walk off of the surface of G to get bigger, right? Remember, I'm stuck on the surface of G. Maybe I'm an ant walking on the circle. And I'm trying to optimize my function f just around that little circle. Well, eventually my gradient is going to tell me, if you want to get bigger, you got to walk off this circle. Now, how do I quantify the, if you want to get bigger, you got to, you got to walk off the surface? Exactly like this. This tells me that if I want to get bigger, I've got to move in the same direction as off of the surface, right? That's what the gradient of g is telling me. It says, 
how I get off of the surface. It's the normal direction to an n minus one dimensional surface. The lambda in here is just a scaling parameter. Remember, these two things are vectors in space, right? One might be longer than the other one, right? They might be stretched or compressed versions of each other. Lambda just says, okay, they're pointing in the same direction. Now I'll stretch them out so that they're exactly the same, right? So without lambda there, this is asking that these things are, par are parallel vectors. Lambda says, okay, you can use me, lambda, to stretch these things so that they're actually exactly equal. And we can write down you know, a mathematical statement using an equality here. Okay, now that you've got a bit of the intuition for just the single constraint example where we have, we're sort of matching up these parallel vectors, let's do that example before we start digging into more complex problems. So let's maximize. So let's maximize. Uh, let's do a three dimensional set. So x plus 2y plus 3z. So this is. Uh, away from the math modeling for a second. This is just illustrative. And let's do it over, uh, let's do a circle. So, or actually, sorry, a sphere, pardon me. Well, Z squared is equal to three. Okay, well, if I wanna translate this into the language of how I started the problem here, this is gonna give me f of x, y, z, the function that I want to maximize, this is x plus 2y plus 3z, and g, my single constraint that I have, is x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and of course I want to set that equal to 3. Well, if we look at the Lagrange multiplier equation, I need the gradient of f is equal to a multiple of the gradient of g. That means that I should be computing up some gradients. So the gradient of f, this is a fun one, one, two, three. And the gradient of g, this is the gradient of this function right here, two x, two y, two z, okay? So it's nice and simple. It's just a pretty little equation. But what we can see here, is if I can take these two things and I set, if I look at my Lagrange multiplier equation, then this is going to give me, if I take uh, gradient of f equal to a multiple of the gradient of g, it's gonna give me in the first component, one is equal to two lambda x. Then in the second component, two is equal to two lambda y. And then in the third component, three is equal to three lambda Z. And now you can pull all of that out. You can solve for X, Y, and Z in terms of lambda. So this gives me X is equal to 1 over 2 lambda. Y is equal to uh, 1 over lambda. And Z is equal to uh, 1 over lambda. Ah, uh, sorry, this should be 2, right? Pardon me. This should be 3 over 2 lambda. Okay, but that's still missing a little bit of information, right? That is not accounting for the constraint yet. Remember, I have this gradient of g, but nothing here is forcing x, y, and z to be constrained to the sphere. So also, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal to 3 gives me, well, what would this give me? If I plug in my values, I get 1 over 4 lambda squared plus, so that's x squared going in, right? And now I have my constrained y variable, 1 over lambda squared, and then plus 9 over 4 lambda squared is equal to 3. Okay, so this is the two-step process. So maybe you were a little bit worried that you had more variables than you had equations, but that's not the case, right? This first piece solves your x, y, and z components, but then you need to make sure that they are on the sphere. So that's where your constraint comes in. This gives you value for lambda. This tells you lambda squared is equal to 42 over 36.
So now you have two values of lambda and they're given, or sorry, you have two values for lambda, the plus or minus of the square roots here. And that means you have two potential candidates for maxima of this function, okay? So you have the first point, I'm gonna call it A. This is the square root of 42 over 14, the square root of 42 over seven, and the square root, or three times the square root of 42, ah, 42 over 14. And you've got another point, which is just the negative of that, okay? So I'm gonna call that B. These are my two candidates for the maximum of my function because they're the ones that solve the Lagrange multiplier equation constrained to my uh, set. Now, in this case, I can check, it's very easy, I can check f of a, this thing is equal to the square root of 42, and I can check f of b, which is equal to the minus square root of 42. So that tells me that clearly f of a is equal uh, to the maximum so far. Now there is one caveat that we have to be careful of. We have to be careful of when the, in this case, the gradient of g is equal to zero. That's not something that we accounted for in this equation, right? Because if the gradient of g is equal to zero, then this would give the gradient of f, which is impossible to make equal to zero. Now, fortunately for us, the only time when that happens is when x, y, and z are all equal to zero. And we can see that that is not on my constraint curve. So we don't have to worry about that case, but I do want you to sort of notice that that is a possibility. Okay, but what does that mean? There's my maximum right there, right? That's my maximal value using Lagrange multipliers, in this case, lambda, in order to solve it. Okay, so what do these two things actually represent? Well, this one represents when f and g, the gradients of f and g point in the same direction. That's when lambda is positive. Whereas this value, b, is when f, grad f and grad g point in opposite directions, right? So f wants to increase, but g says you should go the other way. Right, so that's why we get this negative here or right here, and that's why we have a negative value of lambda. So clearly we need to pick this positive value for this geometric alignment that F says I wanna increase by going this way. G says, yeah, you should try and go that way because it'll get you off this surface. Okay, let's try another example. Let's put another constraint on this. So let's add in, so add in, x is equal to one as well, okay? So the same problem, I still wanna maximize x plus two y plus three z over the sphere, but also I wanna put in a second constraint, right? So now I get two constraints, g1, which is the sphere, is equal to three, and now I get g2, which is this plane x equal to one, right? So this is the slice across the sphere. So this is now just a two dimensional set, right? I took, a, I took a sphere and I cut it. And the only thing that's left are the y and the z variables. In fact, this is just a, sorry, a one dimensional set. This is a circle. Okay, so I've already got the gradient of f. Let's just note some gradients of g. In this case, you know, this is the same one that we already computed, 2x, 2y, 2z, and the gradient of g2, this is 1, 0, 0. Okay, so now we have a new equation that we need to solve, right? We have the original Lagrange multiplier equation that I gave you at the beginning of the lecture. 
Now, I understand that I didn't tell you the geometric intuition for uh, adding in multiple Lagrange multipliers. In this case, I gave you lambda 1 and lambda 2. Well, the principle is still the same, right? So the geometry becomes slightly more complicated. But you should understand that this equation on the right-hand side is the span of the vectors g1 and g2, right? They are scalar multiples added together. So what this says is, OK, f doesn't need to point in the same direction as the normal vector to one of these surfaces. It needs to point in a direction that is spanned by normal vectors now, right? This is uh, the sort of geometric complexity that comes with uh, adding in more constraints. But nonetheless, it's the same principle, right? Del uh, grad G1 and grad G2, these things span a plane now that's perpendicular to my circle that I have restricted myself to. And therefore, in order to make this Lagrange multiplier equation work, I just need to find whenever my function f is telling me to move into the direction spanned by these two gradients. Okay, so the, the geometry is slightly more complex, but the principle is the same. Essentially, the function is telling you to walk off the surface if you want to get bigger. Okay, so let's put this all together. This gives me three equations again. So the grad f, 1 is equal to 2 lambda 1 x plus lambda 2. Two Lagrange multipliers, lambda 1, lambda 2. Then I get 2 is equal to uh, 2 lambda 1 y. And 3 is equal to, uh, in this case, 2 lambda 1 z. Right, so the lambda 2 is only influencing the first equation, and that comes from the fact that my gradient of g is 1, 0, 0. Okay, so now I can solve. This is, again, you know, you can just back solve for x, y, and z here. x is equal to 1 minus lambda 2 over 2 lambda 1. y is equal to... 1 over lambda 1, similar to last time. And z, again, same thing, 3 over 2 lambda 1. So not much changed, but you do have this lambda 2 in here that's constraining your x1. Now, x equal to 1, that's constraint g2. So g2 equal to 1. This is going to give me that 1 minus lambda 2 over 2 lambda 1 is equal to 1. And in particular, you know, you can rearrange this thing. It gives you lambda 2 is equal to uh, 1 minus 2 lambda 1. Okay, so now I have tied those two variables together, right? So the first thing I did is I used the Lagrange multiplier equation to tie x, y, and z into the Lagrange multipliers, lambda 1 and lambda 2. Then I used the first constraint. Or, or the second, however you want to write it, the constraint x equal to 1 to, to tie lambda 1 and lambda 2 together. Then I can put this into constraint 2. So, or the, the other constraint, pardon me. I sort of have these mixed up because I'm doing them in the opposite order. But now I get x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 3 x is equal to 1, and y is equal to 1 over lambda 1, and z is equal to 3 over 2 lambda 1, and this is equal to 3. So notice, again, my constraint already came in. So now I have a new equation for finding lambda 1, and in this case I get lambda 1 squared is equal to 26 over 16. So different than last time. Why is it different than last time? Because last time, x was allowed to vary. x is stuck at 1 now. But the same principle uh, comes in here, right? I've still got two values of lambda 1. It's going to give me two different values of lambda 2 as well. So I'm going to have two points. C, I'll call them because I called them A and B over here previously. I get 1, and then 
2 root 26 divided by 13, and then 3 root 26 divided by 13. And then I also have D, which is going to be 1 minus 2 root 26 over 13, and negative 3 root 26 over 13. Okay, so I have two new points that are candidates for my maximum and minimums here. And now what I can do is I can put these into my original function and I can check which one returns a larger value. Now it turns out that C returns a larger value, but I do want to, again, put an asterisk here. Now, if you think about just before we concluded the previous example, we had to make sure that the gradient of G was not equal to zero, all right? That sort of de destroys a linear independence, right? Gradient of G is not pointing anywhere. Well, you have the same problem here. This comes in to looking for points where delta or nabla G1 and nabla G2, these upside down gradient operators, nablas, when these things are linearly dependent, right? You have to be careful of this because that collapses the dimension and means that lambda 1 and lambda 2 can be chosen, you know, to be multiples of each other. Now you can easily check that this can never happen on our constrained surface, right? Because x is always equal to 1 on our surface, and so the first component here is equal to 2, and the first component here is equal to 1. So I recognize that this is getting very, very complex quickly, so I, I just want you to sort of keep these things in mind. But nonetheless, using our Lagrange multiplier problem here, we can see, we can plug these things into our original f function, this thing returns a maximum f of c is equal to 1 plus the square root of 26. Okay, now the last thing that I want to say is what would happen if I replace one of these constraints and let's say I re replace one with an inequality. So for example, just while I'm looking at this, what if I wanted to do this instead? Well, the way that you're going to do that is you're going to break this up into two different cases. Okay, so the first one, I'll call it S1. This is the set where x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 3 and x is equal to 1. This is the previous example that we just did, that is the border case, okay? The second case is when you have this sort of open component when x is bigger than 1. Now, this is example 2. We already saw that this is, you know, we just did this in the previous example. So example two today. Now, what is this one? Well, the only real constraint here is that you're on the sphere. And then it says, you know, once you try to optimize over that thing, you know, try and find something, an optimum, where x is bigger than one. Well, let's take a look at this. What have we got? We got that... In A, we have the square root of 42 over 14. This thing has x larger than 1. So this is actually just example 1 today. Right? So we've divided it up. There's only one constraint. We just needed to check which one has x larger than 1. That's A. So the question is, which one gives a bigger maximum for the function? You get a bigger maximum when you constrain x to be larger than 1 than when you constrain x to be equal to 1. That is a maximum at f of a. The square root of 42 is bigger than uh, 1 plus the square root of 26. So the max here, max at a. So that's how you would break this thing up. This is only one constraint. These are two constraints.
Okay, in the next video, we're going to apply this to our television problem from the previous video. Okay, so we will actually go back to the modeling aspect of this and we will, um, we will look at how this applies to actual physical optimization problems.